Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part two for this news bulletin today. All right, so we're just gonna continue here. We left off with Egypt. Clinton reassures Egypt's Morzai over US aid. So Clinton reassured Egypt's new leader on Monday that the US would forge ahead with plans to expand economic assistance, despite, that's what they call it, economic assistance, despite anti-American protests that cast new shadows over the US engagement with the region. So, and uh, Egypt actually just borrowed a bunch of money from the IMF and uh, other places as well. So, U.S. aid to Egypt stalled over anti-Islam protests. Monroe was just saying, and Clinton urges Morsi to keep channels open with Israel. The first time they've met since ties were strained by the anti-U.S. riots in Cairo. Clinton's request came on the heels of the rising tension between Israel and Egypt over cross-border attacks emanating from Sinai Peninsula. I've been covering that recently. Um, hours after a border attack from Sinai prompted harsh warnings from Cairo officials about IDF meddling in its territory. This past Friday, an Israeli soldier was killed by Sinai terrorists along the border. The latest series of attacks said earlier on Monday a top Egyptian official threatened to cut the hands off of anybody who incurred into sovereign Egyptian territory. A thinly veiled threat aimed at Israel. Then this article uh, for 925 Syria mortar shells hit Golan Heights and uninjured. Israel files a complaint with the UN after several mortar shells land in Golan, IDF says, incident part of an internal Syrian conflict. It is interesting because uh, the IDF actually deployed forces around this area, I believe, uh, just prior to this happening. Several mortar shells fired from Syrian territory fell inside Golan Heights on Tuesday, marking the first time the ongoing violence in Syria has spilled inside Israel's borders. And I guess Lebanon could file reports to the UN that uh, Israel violates its airspace almost on a daily basis. Obama renews call for ouster of Assad, but he also says the U.S. will do what it must prevent, what it must do to prevent Iran from attaining nuclear weapons. So this is why I think it's a big show, right? Uh, I'm sure that they know that they have it. And why all of a sudden did, are they not backing Israel, right? Why are they not backing the attack? Because I said in yesterday's video, they're playing these powers that be, they're playing a, you know, a dangerous game. So Obama renews call for regime change in Syria, talking about Assad. Then Washington sets to increase aid to Syrian insurgents. See, that's what they're calling him now. I, I noticed that term now, say U.S. officials, insurgents. So they went from peaceful protesters and activists to armed protesters, to uh, a free Syrian army, to now uh, uh, insurgents. And next, they'll just call them right out what they were to begin with, terrorists. But yeah, they said they will not include weapons or ammunition. Now, that's France and other countries that are providing that, along with uh, special forces and intelligence and communications and reconnaissance and all that. Actually, you have Turkey right now, uh, have Turkish officers uh, leading, leading the rebel army. Remember that uh, I covered. Press TV says here, Al-Alam, Damascus bureau chief injured in Damascus. So these are obviously Syrian government uh, forces right there that were hit. It says, a Lebanese national was shot in the back and wounded by sniper fire on Wednesday as he was covering twin blasts in Damascus and the ensuing fight in the capital. They shot a journalist in the back. The foreign-backed insurgents also killed Press TV's correspondent Maya Nasser by sniper fire in Damascus. So this is interesting because some of the develops that I've seen uh, recently have been uh, about the intelligence and that uh, agencies in and around Syria, uh, you know, taking the reins in that. So sniper fire is the first sign. The second thing is, remember the whole thing where, uh, where top chiefs, uh, the Syrian government were assassinated, that was a job. That was definitely not the Free Syrian Army uh, by themselves. That was Western-backed intelligence operation. But this story coincides with another story, which is this. The Damascus military command blast killed four soldiers, injured 14. The assaults left scenes of destruction and shoulder firing following by clashes between the Syrian Army soldiers and the foreign-sponsored insurgents who tried to storm the military headquarters. NATO terrorists bomb school in Syria, so France seeks no-fly zone over Syria to repeat Al-Qaeda Benghazi blowback as NATO desperately attempts to cover up a botched false flag operation in Benghazi, Libya, which left a high-ranking U.S. diplomat dead. France has urged a repeat performance in Syria, that is, arming and providing air support for the very terrorist battalions now operating in Syria that have ravaged and overrun Libya, leaving it a perpetually wrecked, destabilized terrorist epicenter. So following what I was saying about... Um, some things that were be being tied together is uh, recently I covered some articles of Assad saying that the rebels should just give up because they're not going to win. 
Uh, also, you have what? The Free Syrian Army was moving their, their base, uh, the transitional government that's planned after the regime change, the western back regime change, uh, was originally based in Turkey, and they moved it inside Syria, which is a, a sign of confidence. But look at this. Syrian insurgent commander gives up fighting against the government. The commander of the Syrian foreign-sponsored insurgents have decided to give up violence and stop fighting government forces. Then you have several Syrian military defectors rejoin Assad regime. The officers fought in the Free Syrian Army, the main armed opposition group composed of defected Syrian armed forces, personnel, and vo volunteers. So they refused to carry on the armed resistance. They realized uh, that the solution to the Syrian crisis cannot be achieved by holding weapons. And yeah, that's the problem, is trying to uh, defend yourself and all that and, and do what you think is right, and you pick up arms, and you end up just working for this... for this... Uh, this order, right? They, it just works against you. Because only they can use violence, and they don't actually do it themselves. No, they have other people and trick them and, and coerce them into carrying out the violence for them. That's why the powers that be usually fund both sides, so that they can both fight until they're exhausted, and then what comes from the ashes? Oh, their fucking solution that's already pre-planned and ready to go. In Damascus, Syria, life is disappearing from the streets. So it goes on at the top and says the stores are shut and you can, there's a, you don't even see a car pass for every two minutes. It says, meanwhile, the passport office is flooded with Syrians seeking to leave or at least ensure that they are prepared in case the situation deteriorate. So the refugees that did leave, the ones in Jordan, are complaining. Can you believe this? They're angry over harsh conditions, living conditions in the desert tent camp in Jordan. Dozens of Syrian refugees clashed with Jordanian police hurled stones and smashed charity offices in a hospital, said uh, they went on there and they said that they were demanding improved conditions, better food and education for their children. And what the, you know, it's like, what the hell? And should you just be grateful that they're helping you talking about education for your children? But I did just cover this about how the refugees, you know, we're going to see what happens, what transpires over the winter here, because a lot of these, because of the summer and warm weather, it's been easy on the refugees. We're not easy, but easier than what it's going to be in the winter so probably a lot of people are going to die over the winter so man who helped capture libya's muammar Gaddafi dies the man who helped capture the libyan's uh, leader has died of injuries sustained due to torture by a group of Gaddafi loyalists who has kidnapped him they say so like one of the commentators says this doesn't really hold water this story about him being shot in the neck and the stomach at the time he was kidnapped he was severely tortured by the kidnappers and then uh, it says here he was freed several weeks ago after what? Um, after being in their captivity for how long? Almost a year. It says he was taken to the French capital, Paris, for medical treatment where he died of injuries. So a lot of the comments are something that you can agree on. Well, you know, you don't have any sympathy for him. Uh, he, you know, basically sold out his country in that. And this could be a sign that uh, Gaddafi loyalists and the Gemma Haria are gaining strength. Maybe that's what actually happened i don't know in libya with the embassy attack you know maybe it was a false flag so that they can have uh clamp down on security there or like this commenter said uh, this may be an internal problem among the terrorists which is going on right we've uh, i've been covering that lately in, in somalia the, they're, they're separating the factions in mali uh the Tureg and that rebels now they're having problems over there now that's why the french and the u.s forces are coming in you know with the free syrian army you just saw it they're having splits a lot of factions splitting right now libya drafting emergency law after security breakdown libya's national congress is drafting an emergency law to tackle the country's security problems they didn't exactly specify what they were going to do but they said they will allow the executive to take control of the security vacuum. More on uh, Libya. Clashes in Tripoli as Libyan militias feel unappreciated. Argument leads to gun battle outside National Congress meeting. Fires from multiple Libyan militia factions engaged in a gun battle today. So see, this kind of verifies what I was saying, what, you know, what that commenter was saying too. Today in the capital city of Tripoli, fighting in front of the hotel hosting a National Congress meeting after a dispute among different protesting groups. It's basically over the um, the government's move uh, to take former military control over them. So many factions were involved in last year's civil war, complained they've gone unappreciated in recent moment or recent months. So yeah, this was part of the um, Marines being dispatched to Libya, um, and also this emergency law being drafted as well. Lib Libyan militias melt into the desert and wait for another day. So. In, in reeling in the face of the popular backlash that followed the attack on the con U.S. consulate in, in Libya, uh, the analysts say these groups are well entrenched and used to 
operating in hostile environments that may have been melted away for now, but maybe not for long. Prior to that, their autonomy was protected by the weakness of the Libya's new government. So like I said, maybe that was the whole point of the embassy attack, right? Was to make them look bad so that the Western and the French, they have all their oil interests and contracts ready, ready to go. They want, they want commerce to continue now, so they're done with these extremists. They don't really want them in control. They want the oil contracts to flow. So it says here, Fed's hired British security firm to protect Benghazi consulate. So the State Department signed a six-figure deal with the British firm to protect the U.S. consulate in, in Libya just four months before the attack. Of course, they were warned about it by the actual um, ambassador himself, saying that al-Qaeda had him on a hit list. And the former president or prime minister in Libya's trans, uh, transitional government, sorry, he actually warned them too last year in December about an oncoming attack and lack of security. So we might have to actually do three videos here. So. Uh, just a lot going on. I wish I could cover other stuff, uh, eugenics, the economy, what's going on in Europe with the protests and that, Big Brother, but uh, this is at the forefront. So remember I just covered this, Mali secular Tureg rebel splinter new group says independence is unrealistic. So then I saw a bunch of other, other articles come up today, September 26th, intervention in Mali of France launches Operation Sabre in West Africa. This is to rescue its nationals held hostage and flush out Islamist terror groups in West Africa region. French officials said 80 military vehicles, helicopter pilot trainers, as well as commandos from the contingents in Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa, Somalia, and that um, were expected to join Operation Sabre. That's like I said, they were, they're pretty much done with Somalia, so they're moving on. U.S., France seek African force in Mali. Editor's note from Stratwrist says, let us not forget that the U.S.-European misadventure in Libya created this problem. NATO-trained paramilitary forces, if that's what you can call them, left Libya and occupied their southwestern neighbors in Mali. Is it possible that those well-trained fighters in Syria may relocate as well? Remember, Syrian insurgent commander gives up fighting against government. The U.S. and France want the United Nations to back an African-led peacekeeping force to restore order in northern Mali, where Tureg militants and al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorists have expanded their reach since the March coup against their civilian government in Bamako. And of course, like everything else, it remember it being covered as what, a false flag or a, um, intelligence-operated coup. So again, just like Libya, they need to go in there and get out the extremists that they used and um, secure their interests. Mali Islamists are becoming increasingly repressive. The chaos in Mali is a direct result of the destabilization following the U.S. NATO war in Libya. So the Islamic extremists in control of northern Mali are becoming increasingly repressive, according to Human Rights Watch, in amputating limbs, whipping people in the streets, and stoning people to death, even for some having the wrong ringtones on their cell phones. So the military coup that took place in Mali is a monument to the consequences of U.S. interventionism, says resulting in a power vacuum. It says rebel troops seized power and toppled the government in a bid to oust a democratically elected uh, president, probably a Western puppet, who they claim insufficiently supported the military in a fight against the Turk militants waging an insurgency in the north. And what did they want? They wanted independence. So Libyan leader Gaddafi had hired and armed many Turek fighters to defend him against the NATO-backed rebellion in Libya, and they returned to Mali at the Libya's war end stronger and more determined than ever, leading to a coup headed by uh, the captain who was trained by the U.S. military. As with previous U.S. interventions of late, militants allying themselves with the ideas of al-Qaeda seem to crop up only after the U.S. destabilizes the country. The authors of this uh, article say Mali was a stable, comparatively democratic country in the region prior to the destabilization following the war in Libya. And Kenyan fighter jets attack airport in Somalia. So Kenyan troops patrol in Somalia. I just covered how um, the civilians were fleeing. It says our forces have reached uh, Kismio with jets and they have destroyed the armory and warehouses used by Al-Shabaab. So Al-Shabaab denies a report saying the Kenyan Air Force may be trying to boost the morale of its demoralized soldiers. I don't know about that. So they have this article, R, the end of Somali pirate days. One of them said, there's nothing to do here these days. The hopes for a revitalized market are not high. The number of hijacked ships have gone from 47 in 2010 to just five so far this year. Many Somalis say good riddance. Pirates brought vices like drugs and AIDS and nothing else, says one villager elder. So go in there and check out some videos I made a while back. I referenced to them sometimes, the Big Bad Somali Pirates. And how it's a sad, tragic story of how they actually were a strong um, uh, country, almost, I think, even a kingdom in that area. And they ruled their little trade routes and stuff like that. And now they have to just try to steal for scraps. 
and have Canadian and British oil companies come in and exploit them. Thanks.